Okay, this is part eight of Left-Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder by Lenin. Part eight, no compromises, question mark. No compromises? In the quotation from the Frankfurt pamphlet, we saw how emphatically the lefts advanced this slogan. It is sad to see people who doubtless consider themselves to be Marxists and who want to be Marxists, forgetting the fundamental truths of Marxism. This is what Engels, who, like Marx, was one of those rarest of authors whose every sentence in every one of their great works is of remarkably profound content, wrote in 1874 in opposition to the manifesto of the 33 Communard Blancists. Quote, we are communists, wrote the Communard Blancists in their manifesto, because we want to attain our goal without stopping at intermediate stations, without any compromises, which only postpone the day of victory and prolong the period of slavery. The German communists are communists, because through all the intermediate stations and all compromises created not by them, but by the course of historical development, they clearly perceive and constantly pursue the final aim, viz. the abolition of classes and the creation of a society in which, the, in which there will be no private ownership of land or of the means of production. The 33 Blancists are communists because they imagine that merely because they want to skip the intermediate stations and compromises, that settles the matter. And if it begins in the next few days, as has been definitely settled, and they once come to the helm, communism will be introduced the day after tomorrow. If that is not immediately possible, they are not communists. What childish innocence it is to present impatience as a theoretically convincing argument. Frederick Engels, program of the communists Blancists from the German social democratic newspaper Volkstadt 1874, number 73, given in the Russian translation of articles 1871 to 1875, Petrograd 1919, pages 52 to 53. So that's the end of that quote. In the same article, Engels expresses his profound esteem for Vailant and speaks of the undeniable merit of the latter, who, like Guzda, was one of the most prominent leaders of international socialism up to August 1914, when they both turned traitor to socialism. But Engels does not allow an obvious mistake to pass without a detailed analysis. Of course, to very young and inexperienced revolutionaries, as well as to petty bourgeois revolutionaries of even a very respectable age and very experienced, it seems exceedingly dangerous, incomprehensible and incorrect to allow compromises. And many sophists, being super experienced or excessively experienced politicians, reason exactly in the same way as the British leaders of opportunism mentioned by Comrade Lansbury. Quote, if it is permissible for the Bolsheviks to make such and such a compromise, then why should we not be allowed to make any compromise? End quote. But proletarians schooled in numerous strikes to take only this manifestation of the class struggle usually understand quite well the very profound philosophical, historical, political, and psychological truth expounded by Engels. Every proletarian has been through strikes and has experienced compromises with the hated oppressors and exploiters when the workers had to go back to work either without having achieved anything or consenting to a partial satisfaction of their demands. Every proletarian owing to the conditions of the mass struggle and the sharp intensification of class antagonisms in which he lives, notices the difference between a compromise enforced by objective conditions, such as lack of strike funds, no outside support, extreme hunger and exhaustion, 
a compromise which in no way diminishes the revolutionary devotion and readiness for further struggle on the part of the workers who have agreed to such a compromise and a compromise by traitors who try to ascribe to outside causes their own selfishness. Um, open parentheses, strike breakers also affect compromises. Mm. Close parentheses, um, cowardice, desire to toady to the capitalists and readiness to yield to intimidation, sometimes to persuasion, sometimes to sops, and sometimes to flattery on the part of the capitalists. Such cases of traitors compromises by trade union leaders are particularly plentiful in the history of the British labor movement. But in one form or another, nearly all workers in all countries have witnessed the same sort of thing. Of course, individual cases of exceptional difficulty and intricacy occur when it is possible to determine the real character of this or that compromise, only with the greatest difficulty. Just as there are cases of homicide where it is very difficult to decide whether the homicide was fully justified and even essential, as for example, legitimate self-defense, or due to unpardonable negligence, or even to a cunningly executed plan. Of course, in politics, in which extremely complicated national and international relations between classes and parties have sometimes to be dealt with, very many cases will arise that will be much more, much more difficult than a legitimate compromise during a strike or the treacherous compromise of a strike, strike breaker or of a treacherous leader, etc. It would be absurd to concoct a recipe or general rule, i.e. no compromise, to serve all cases. One must have the brains to analyse the situation in each separate case. Incidentally, the significance of a party organisation and of party leaders worthy of the name lies precisely in the fact that they help by means of the prolonged, persistent, varied and all-round efforts of all thinking representatives of the given class, asterisk, in the acquisition of the necessary knowledge, the necessary experience, and apart from knowledge and experience, the necessary political instinct for the speedy and correct solution of intricate political problems. The asterisk, in every class, even in the most enlightened countries, even in the case of the most advanced class, placed by the circumstances of the moment in a state of exceptional elevation of all spiritual forces, there always are, and as long as classes exist, as long as classless society has not fully entrenched and consolidated itself and has not developed on its own foundation, there inevitably will be representatives of the class who do not think and are incapable of thinking. Were this not so, capitalism would not be the oppressor of the masses it is. End of um, asterisk. Naive and utterly inexperienced people imagine that it is sufficient to admit the permissibility of compromises in general in order to obliterate the dividing line between opportunism against which we wage and must, and must wage an irreconcilable struggle and revolutionary Marxism or communism. But if such people do not yet know that all dividing lines in nature and in society are mutable and to a certain extent conventional, they cannot be assisted otherwise than by a long process of training, education, enlightenment, and by political and everyday experience. It is important to single out from the practical questions of the politics of each separate or specific historical moment, those which reveal the principal type of impermissible, treacherous compromises embodying the opportunism that is fatal to the revolutionary class and to exert all, all efforts to explain them and combat them. <clears throat> During the imperialist war of, 1918, of 1914 to 18, between two groups of equally predatory and rapacious countries, the principal fundamental type of opportunism was social chauvinism, that is, the support of defence of the fatherland, which in such a war was really equivalent to defence of the predatory interests of one's own bourgeoisie. After the war, 
the defense of the robber league of nations, the defense of direct or indirect alliances with the bourgeoisie of one's own country against the revolutionary proletariat and the Soviet movement, and the defense of bourgeois democracy and bourgeois parliamentar parliamentarism against the Soviet power became the principal manifestations of those impermissible and treacherous compromises, the sum total of which constituted the opportunism that is fatal to the revolutionary proletariat and its cause. <clears throat> Oh, excuse me. Okay. Uh, quote, to reject most emphatically all compromises with other parties, all policy of manoeuvring and compromise, right, the German lefts in the Frankfurt pamphlet. Hmm. It is a wonder that Lenin continues, it is a wonder that holding such views, these lefts do not emphatically condemn Bolshevism. For the German lefts must know that the whole history of Bolshevism, both before and after the October Revolution, is full of instances of manoeuvring, temporizing and compromising with other parties, bourgeois parties included. To carry on a war for the overthrow of the international bourgeoisie, a war, a war which is a hundred times more difficult, prolonged and complicated than the most stubborn of ordinary wars between states, and to refuse beforehand to manoeuvre, to utilise the conflict of interests, even though temp temporary, among one's enemies, to refuse to temporise and compromise with possible, even though transitory, unstable, vacillating and conditional allies, is not this ridiculous in the extreme? Is it not as though when making a difficult ascent of an unexplored and hitherto inaccessible mountain, we were to refuse beforehand ever to move in zigzags, ever to retrace our steps, ever to abandon the course once selected to try others. And yet, people who are so ignorant and inexperienced, if youth were the explanation, it would not be so bad. Young people are ordained by God himself to talk such nonsense for a period, could meet with the support, whether direct or indirect, open or covert, whole or partial, does not matter, of certain members of the Dutch Communist Party, exclamation, exclamation. After the first socialist revolution of the proletariat, after the overthrow of the bourgeoisie in one country, the proletariat of that country for a long time remains weaker than the bourgeoisie, simply because of the latter's extensive international connections and also because of the spontaneous and continuous restoration and regeneration of capitalism and the bourgeoisie by the small commodity producers of the country which has overthrown the bourgeoisie. The more powerful enemy can be conquered only by exerting the utmost effort and by necessarily, thoroughly, carefully, attentively and skillfully taking advantage of every, even the smallest, rift among the enemies of every antagonism of interest among the bourgeoisie of the various countries and among the various groups or types of bourgeoisie within the various countries. By taking advantage of every, even the smallest opportunity of gaining a mass ally, even though this ally be temporary, vacillating, unstable, unreliable and conditional. Those who do not understand this do not understand even a particle of Marxism or of scientific modern socialism in general. Those who have not proved by deeds over a fairly considerable period of time and in fairly varied political situations, their ability to apply this truth in practice have not yet learned to assist the revolutionary class in its struggle for the emancipation of toiling humanity from the exploiters. And this applies equally to the period before and to the period after the conquest of political power by the proletariat. Our theory is not a dogma, but a guide to action, said Marx and Engels. And the great mistake, the great crime, such patented, patented? Marx and Marxists as Karl Kautsky, Otto Bauer, etc., commit is that they have not understood this, have been unable to apply it at the most 
important moments of the proletarian revolution. Political activity is not the pavement of the Nevsky project. I'll start again. <laughs> 